It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor, coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. And today we're going to talk about a story that we've heard about and even Hollywood has talked about. And it's dealing with the subject of the Queen of Sheba. You find this story in 1 Kings chapter 10. You can find it in a couple of parallel passages. A little bit of additions uh, and variation between the two. 1 Kings chapter 10 verse 1. And we'll be looking at this together. 1 Kings chapter 10 verse 1. Now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels that bore spices, very much gold, and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So this goes down in history as a, an unusual story because it's, first of all, it's a royal visit. Usually kings and queens sent ambassadors, they sent messages, they sent emissaries. When one king would go and visit another king, it was a sign of submission. Uh, you know, it's usually the lesser would go to and visit the greater. The greater, like a mountain, would say, I'm not going anywhere. If you want to talk to me, you come to me. And I'm not saying that Solomon had that attitude, but the very fact that she came was a tremendous honor when a queen comes to visit you. She came in person. She had heard about the, the wonderful wisdom of Solomon and she wanted to see it firsthand. You know, it was back in uh, May 2007 when the uh, Queen Elizabeth visited um, our country and and she made a, a royal visit. She was coming to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the founding of an English town on our continent called Jamestown. I thought that was very interesting significance. The Queen of England comes for the 400th anniversary of the celebration of the English settlement on our shores. And uh, it was a big event and all the cameras got out and they gave her, as you would say, a royal welcome. Now as we prepare to study the story of the Queen of Sheba, I just want you to know that this was the fulfillment of a prophecy. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Psalm 72. We've talked before about how King Solomon was really a type of Christ. Solomon was the son of David, just as Jesus is called the son of David. King David wrote, sometime before this happened, his last psalm. You might be thinking the last psalm of David was 150. Well, David didn't write all of the psalms. He wrote many of them. Asaph, the chief musician, wrote many of them. But the last psalm of David is Psalm 72. It says so because it's right at the end of the psalm. And it says a psalm, verse 1, a psalm for Solomon. David wrote a song for his son Solomon who he knew would be king. We're not going to read all of this, but just notice it's a psalm for Solomon. Give the king thy judgments, O God, in righteousness unto the king's son. Solomon, like Jesus, was the son of David, the king of righteousness. Go to verse 10. The kings of Tarshish and the isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer their gifts. Now this is David writing. Did that happen? David was not only a psalmist and a king, he was a prophet. The royalty of Sheba did bring gifts to Solomon. Yea, kings shall fall down before him, and all nations will serve him. Now this is not just a prophecy about Solomon. This is a prophecy ultimately about Jesus. And then you can read verse 15. And he shall live, and to him shall be given the gold of Sheba. There you've got it again. To Solomon shall be given the gold of Sheba. Sheba represented the Gentile nations. To Christ the worship and the recognition and the wealth of the Gentiles come. And then you read in Psalm 72, the last verse, verse 20, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. 
Now this is the last Psalm of David. I think that's interesting that the last Psalm of David he writes sort of as a will for his son that he would prosper, that he would be righteous and a prophecy that other nations would come to him as long as he was faithful and he could be a witness for them. So then you've got the record in the Bible of this royal visit. You can also read the parallel verse if you go to 2 Chronicles. Chronicles comes right after Kings. 2 Chronicles chapter 9 verse 1. It also tells about the visit of the Queen of Sheba. Now in our last study on Solomon I told you that during this time in Solomon's history it was the zenith or the highest part in the history of King Solomon. And so the, the kind of the cherry on the banana split so to speak was the visit from the Queen of Sheba because it represented the nations of the world coming to Israel to learn about their God. What, wa what was the purpose for God calling Israel as a nation? Because they were the chosen people he just said you know I like you better than everyone else? No. He chose them to be a nation of kings and priests that they might be witnesses to the other nations that they might share their light. Their nation was to be a light on the hill for all nations. And when the Queen of Sheba came to Solomon because she had heard about his God, this was the ultimate fulfillment of that prophecy of what God wanted from his people. For all nations to flow unto them. Matter of fact, if you've got your... Well, let me read this to you first. 2 Chronicles 9 verse 1. And the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon and she came to test Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem with a very great company and camels that carried spices and gold in abundance and precious stones and she came into Solomon and spoke to him of all that was in her heart and Solomon told her all her questions and there was nothing hidden from Solomon that he did not tell her. Is there any prayer that you can pray to Jesus that he does not have an answer for? Is there any question you might ask Jesus that he is bewildered by? Is there any enigma too hard for him? Any conundrum he can't grapple with? Or does Jesus know all things? So Solomon again here is a type of Jesus who is the real king of kings. And you must just you know imagine what it must have looked like. This armada of camels coming across the desert because they had heard about the wisdom of Solomon. Now maybe before I go too far I should answer this question where is Sheba? Where is this nation, this country called Sheba? And there's been some speculation about it. If you talk to our Ethiopian friends they have a very rich tradition that their land was the land of Sheba. And while there is some truth to that, let me explain, you gotta look at the map here. If you see the straits there but that separate the Red Sea from the Arabian Sea. It's a very narrow strait. And there was a country in southern Arabia called Sheba. You can see it's the green territory there. But they also, their kingdom reached across that very narrow channel into Ethiopia. But the royal residence was actually in southern Arabia. Matter of fact, Sheba means south country. It was the furthest south you could go in Arabia and that's why it got that name. It was a very rich country not only because evidently they had access to the mines of Ophir and the golden mines of Havilah but um, they controlled the naval trade that went from the Indian Ocean and the Pacific and the Arabian Ocean up into the Mediterranean and Europe all of that trade had to go through that isthmus there. How many of you have heard about the Somali pirates today? Well that's right there off that horn of Africa. It's the same trade route that they're controlling and that's why they're able to exploit it the way they do. Well the country of Sheba controlled, they got a tariff, they got a tax from everybody that brought their goods. They had the richest goods from all over the world came through them. They also had an access to the gold mines of Africa and so it was probably there in southern Arabia but it was a very wealthy country. Now that also means when you consider where she was coming from you take your little ruler on your map when you get home and you'll find out that the trip was 1,400 miles. The fact that she was able to go and that was one way she had to go home. 1,400 miles to hear somebody's wisdom you must really treasure wisdom if you're going to make a trip that far. 
And that is what the Bible says is the most important thing. You need to commend her. By the way, do you know Jesus speaks about the Queen of Sheba? If you ever want to know if something is legend or true, find out what Jesus said about it. Jesus speaks about the visit, the visit of the Queen of Sheba as a historical fact. I think you can believe it. Matthew 12, 42. Jesus says, The Queen of the South, that's what Sheba means, will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth. So when Jesus refers to the country of Sheba, how does he call it? The ends of the earth. I mean, when you went to Sheba back then, you came to the sea and it stopped. It was as far south as you could go in Arabia. Christ says it was the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And then Jesus said, A greater than Solomon is here. Now, if I lived back in Bible times during the time of Solomon, knowing what I know now, I'd want to get there. I would want to see the temple that he built. I would want to hear the wisdom of Solomon. I'd like to look at Solomon and see if he looked more like David or Bathsheba. But I'd like to be there. I'd like to hear, of course I'd have to speak Hebrew, but assuming I could, I'd like to hear the gems of truth and wisdom and knowledge that poured from his lips and just the incredible. He had to sit as a judge every day and hear all kinds of very difficult cases. You remember the two women that brought the baby? and how he dealt with that. That was only a small sample of what Solomon did to demonstrate his wisdom on a daily basis. Wouldn't you want to hear Solomon? Jesus said, a greater than Solomon is here. There was another son of David that was even wiser than Solomon. And that's Jesus, that other king. You have the wisdom of Jesus right here. Of course we got a lot of the wisdom of Solomon here too, don't we? In the Proverbs so she came to hear it. Now you might ask the question, how did you hear about Solomon? How did you hear about this wisdom? Well, no doubt all of the, the uh, sea traffic and the caravans that came through her country, you can read for instance in 1 Kings 9, that's the previous chapter where the Queen of Sheba appears in chapter 10. Then Hiram sent his servants with the fleet, seamen who knew the sea, to work with the servants of Solomon. These sailors went down there and they went to Ophir to acquire 420 talents of gold, a talent's about 60 pounds. From there and they brought it to King Solomon. So as these ships went back and forth they would have to stop at the straits there and where the um, tax collectors for Sheba lived and she would hear these reports when they stopped to be reprovisioned about the wisdom and the glory of Solomon and she'd see their ships going back with all this gold and she'd say, wow, what kind of king is this? What kind of kingdom is this? and she was searching for the truth. Now we don't know exactly what the religion of Sheba was but it was probably a, a melting pot of the religions of the world because it's often true that uh, when you have a country that is sort of on a trade route they would pick up some of the pieces of truth and religion from many different belief systems. And so she probably had sort of a potluck of different beliefs from the different gods of the different nations and she was wondering what is the truth? She heard little snippets and little quotes and reports about the judgments of Solomon and the glory of Solomon and the wisdom of Solomon. She thought this king knows the truth. He has the truth. I want that truth. She cherished it more than anything. You know so many in positions of leadership become cynical. Like when Jesus stood before Pilate and he spoke of the truth. There, one wiser than Solomon was in the presence of Pilate. And that ruler said, Now, ah, what is truth? Who can know? And he didn't even wait for an answer from Jesus. How sad. Well, that wasn't the attitude of the Queen of Sheba. She was willing to give everything and go to the ends of the earth to find out what is truth. You know, some things are absolute, and there is an absolute truth. I'm surprised how often I hear people say, well, you know, your truth is true for you and then I got my truth that's true for me and my truth is just as important as your truth. It's like everybody's got their own truth and whatever you think is true is true. You make it true by believing it. That's a very deadly belief that every man can sort of just create his own truth. Solomon said, there is a way that seems right to a man but the end thereof are the ways of death. There is only one truth, friends we cannot make our own. Amen? So she had heard about this. Wherever the ships of Tarshish sailed they carried the wonderful report 
of Solomon. Why did she come all that distance? Well, you can even look back to some of Solomon's gems of truth. Solomon said in Proverbs 8, verse 11, For wisdom is better than rubies, and all things that one might desire cannot be compared with her. Now, we've already read enough about the Queen of Sheba to know she was fabulously wealthy herself. Just the constant income that was, you know, it's uh, amazing. In Saudi Arabia today, things now are sort of like they used to be back in her day. You think, how can they get so wealthy out there in the desert? You ever wondered about that? How many of you have seen some of the treasures of Dubai? They've built an indoor, out there in the desert, they've built an indoor mall with a snow skiing mountain. Have you seen some of the pictures floating around on the internet of that? The tallest building in the world, costing over a billion dollars, I forget, it's some phenomenal mount. They're going to build one there that's over a mile high now. In the desert, they got a gold-plated Mercedes, some of these sheiks that live there. Largest airplane built is an Airbus, I forget what the number is. It's a double-decker 747 is what it is. It is a real Airbus. One of these has recently been purchased by a sheik, one of the richest people in the world, multi-billionaire. I think he's paying three billion dollars. He bought one brand new. He's going to outfit it as a flying palace for he and his entourage and family. Out in the desert. And uh, Dubai was becoming one of the most popular tourist attractions until this economic um, unraveling that they've had because of all the oil money that was flowing in there. So just to let you know it can happen. Out there in the desert controlling that flow of those continents through that strait, through the caravan van trail, she had lots of money. All the best spices and the best clothes and the things from India and the Orient came through her front yard and she got to take the best of everything. But she wasn't happy. She wasn't satisfied. She wanted to know what is truth. You know, Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's what she cherished. She wanted that wisdom. She wanted that knowledge. So her crews and her ambassadors had heard about it. She could have sent somebody, but she wanted to see it firsthand. First Kings chapter 10, when she heard of the fame of Solomon, she wanted answers. You know, I actually found a quote where it says in Psalms 19 verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold, speaking of the truth, the law of the Lord, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. She had gold, she had the best food, she had the spices, but she wanted truth. She heard of Solomon's wealth, she heard of his works, she heard of his wisdom, and she heard about his worship. So she heard about the name of his God. She wanted to know about his God. You know, Josephus, the famous Jewish historian, he talks about the Queen of Sheba, gives a little additional insight. Here's a quote from Josephus. When this queen, this is from the books, the writings of Flavius Josephus, when the queen heard of the virtue and the prudence of Solomon, she had a great mind to see him. She being desirous to be satisfied by her own experience and not by bare hearing, for reports thus heard are likely enough to comply with a false opinion. She resolved to come to him in order to have a trial of his wisdom while she, pro while she proposed questions of great difficulty and entreated that he would solve their hidden meaning. She had a long time to think about those questions too during that caravan journey across the desert, 1400 miles. Well, it took Lewis and Clark to cover that kind of distance. Of course, then they were doing some of it by river, it took them about a year to get to the um, uh, west coast. Over two years round trip. So she wanted to know what was the truth and she made that great journey. She not only wanted to know, she wanted to know for herself. It's one thing to say, well you know my, my parents, uh, they had an experience with the Lord, they were converted, they're Christians and so I'm a Christian because they made a decision. Or my grandparents or my great grandparents and you are trying to ride on the um, coattails or the apron strings of some experience that your parents or grandparents had. You know you have to admire the Queen of Sheba because though she was a queen and she could send somebody, 
She could have said, uh, Solomon, could you please text message me? <laughs> but she didn't. She said, I want to see for myself. I want to experience it for myself. Friends, do you want your own experience with the Son of David, Jesus? Are you satisfied to have it vicariously through several generations? It's not going to be enough. You want to have it yourself. It needs to be personal. Luke 11.31. Here's where I quoted Matthew. Here's Luke's quote. The Queen of the South will rise up in judgment with the men of this generation to condemn them. For she, the Queen of Sheba in the judgment, sounds like she's saved. So she's going to rise up and condemn those who did not appreciate the truth of Jesus. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. God invites us to come and to ply him with questions. In our prayers, in our meditations, as we read the word, it's okay to not understand everything. That's why the Lord implores us to reason with him. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, Come now, says the Lord, let us reason together. He wants you to probe him with questions. Though your sins be like scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Now there is a question. How does that happen? Can a leopard change his spots? Can an Ethiopian change his skin? That's a mystery. Reason with him about that. How can I have a changed heart? How can I be a new creature? Now this is the big question we need an answer to. Amen? Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Then another wonderful point I want you to consider is she came all that way and Solomon was a busy man. He's building temples and he's built, he was a great builder. And he's involved in international trade and he had hundreds of wives and concubines. Now, you know how many weddings you have to plan for? You know how much time that takes? He was busy. Oh, king, you got another wedding today <laughs> on your schedule. So here you got this busy king and she says, I'd like to have an appointment with you. He stops what he's doing and he gives her the time that she needs. He receives her. He receives her. Who does Solomon the son of David represent? Jesus the son of David. And Christ even makes a comparison, doesn't he, between Solomon and himself. Did Solomon stop and have time for her? Is anything in the record that we read say that he was really busy? He gave her all the time and attention she asked for. A king! I mean, that's a lot to think about that Jesus would have that kind of time to give us. If Solomon would give it to Sheba, by the way, she showed she was interested. She came seeking. She had put so much time and energy into seeking. How could Solomon tell her no? When someone comes all that way, you know, sometimes I'll do an evangelistic meeting. I'll go to another part of the world to do this evangelistic meeting. And then there'll be people who are living in a house or a hut right next door to the stadium and they don't come. And it kind of hurts me. And I'll chastise the neighborhood and say, look, I came all the way from the United States to share with you. I want you to walk the next 300 yards. And I, I kind of shame them into coming. Whatever it takes, right? When someone puts all that energy and time into seeing you and spending a little time with you, uh, you want to see them. And I expect that she probably sent riders out ahead before she came to announce her arrival and to make sure that the king understood what her intentions were. And he received her. Jesus will receive you. Now, I've got to stop right here. Oh, by the way, Proverbs 18, verse 16. Again, I'm quoting from Solomon's wisdom. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. When the messengers came from the queen of Sheba to Solomon said, you know, there, there is not just a, a little caravan. There is a big caravan. And if you're bringing 120 talents of gold, 120 talents, one talent, 60 pounds, 120 times 60 pounds. Someone quick, what's 120 times 60? Huh? 7,200 pounds of gold. That'd even make a camel tire. When you're carrying that much gold, you not only have your caravan, you've got an armed escort. Then you've got all the food that you need to take those people across the desert. She must have looked like the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. I mean, it was a big deal. When uh, Jacob was going to meet with his brother, 
and his brother was still miffed over his stealing the birthright, what did Jacob do before he saw him? He sent a gift out ahead, and the gift prepared the way, kind of softened his heart. And so they said, wow, she's bringing a lot of gifts. And when people came to see a king, they brought their gifts. That was very common. And so uh, she came bringing her gifts. Now, I'll tell you what I wanted to say. In spite of the romantic notions you might have or movies that have been produced, there is, it's a fable that Solomon and uh, Beth, or that the Queen of Sheba had a love affair. Um, that's, a, uh, that's a video cover I captured off line of Yul Brenner and Gina Lola Brigida. Anyone remember them? My mom was actually in them. A couple of movies with Yul Brenner. That's not my mom, though. <laughs> Hollywood always wants to turn it into a romance. Matter of fact, even the story of Moses in the Ten Commandments, they make it out like Moses had some sword affair with the Queen of Egypt. Where is that in the Bible? That's not in the Bible, is it? But you've all seen the Ten Commandments, right? Yeah, so Hollywood always said, there's nothing at all in the text that says that Solomon and Sheba had anything other than an intellectual relationship. She was coming seeking truth. She had enough money, she could have any man she wanted. She didn't need Solomon like that. Now, the, the Ethiopians have a tradition that they had an affair, and she became pregnant. And she went back home, and she gave birth to a son, and that later Solomon... When he sent the Ark of the Covenant down and gave it to the Ethiopians and the Ethiopians claim we've got the real Ark of the Covenant because Solomon gave it to the son of the Queen of Sheba but there's some Bible problems with that the Ark was still in the temple up until the time of Hezekiah hundreds of years later so that fable doesn't go along with the Bible no offense to my friends that may believe in the Ethiopian tradition but there's all kinds of stories that spring up Everything you read about the Bible, she was looking for truth. She had questions. She, her interest was a mental interest. Solomon had plenty of wives also. That was not just because she was a woman, he was a man. We don't know. She might have been 80 years old. Do you know the Bible doesn't say? There's a picture for you. That ruins everything, doesn't it? <laughs> she might not have looked at all like Gina Lola Brigida. <laughs> it says that she treasured truth. It doesn't say that she was some, you know, voluptuous, seductive queen. It just tells us she was interested in truth. So I just wanted to destroy those romantic notions that you may have had in your mind because it really ruins the real message of the story. She's seeking for truth. She's seeking for wisdom. She's seeking for answers. She's seeking for God. She's seeking for something that can be trusted. It had nothing to do with uh, any kind of sensual relationship. And I've just ruined it for you, didn't I? What was her response to what she found? Second Chronicles chapter 9 verse 3 And the queen of Sheba, she saw the wisdom of Solomon and the house that he built. Now, do you mark in your Bibles? I'm just wondering, how many of you make any kind of notation or marking in your Bible just for your own personal? That's okay to do that. By the way, if you didn't do that, if nobody ever did that, your Bible would not have chapters and verses. You know how we get chapters and verses? Somebody took a long trip and they're reading their Bible and they wanted to find things again and so they put in chapter numbers and verse numbers and it helped them. Later it was adopted by everybody. That's why you got marking in your Bible. You might circle some words in here. What did she see? Look, 2 Chronicles 9, I'm reading verses 3 to 8. When she saw the wisdom, you might circle the word wisdom, of Solomon. In the house that he had built, in the food, I've circled the word house, I've circled the word food of his table, and the sitting of his servants. You can circle servants, or even sitting of his servants. And the attendance of his ministers, I have circled ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, I highlighted, and their apparel, and his burnt offerings that he offered up in the house of Jehovah. You know, you look at these things here, and this is really a picture of what God wants us to see in the church. Notice what her response was. There was no more spirit in her. How many of you have a different translation there for no more spirit? What does it say? Uh, I'm reading now from the New King James. Does anyone have it say there's no more breath? 
in their translation? It says there was no more breath in here. The word for spirit there is ruach. In Hebrew, it's the word breath. It's the same word when God breathed into Adam, he became a living soul. Same word. You ever heard the expression breathtaking? You know where that word comes from? Where that expression comes from? This verse. You ever heard the expression, I was breathless? I waited breathlessly. It was a, a breathtaking view. It comes from this verse where when the Queen of Sheba saw the glory of Solomon, she heard the wisdom of Solomon, she saw the servants of Solomon, the house that she built, she took all this in, she was breathless. That's where the phrase, the expression comes from. A lot of expressions you use come from the Bible. In the nick of time, the skin of my teeth, that's from the book of Job. Turn the other cheek, of course. A lot of expressions, as you know, they come from the Bible. And this is where that expression comes from. Queen of Sheba, couldn't find any words other than it took her breath away. You ever heard a girl say, oh, you took my breath away. <laughs> First time that's recorded in history is when the Queen of Sheba tried to explain what she saw. Maybe that's why they wrote a romance novel about it. Solomon in his glory left her breathless. It was a breathtaking experience. Now I'm going to break those things you circled down a little bit. First of all, she saw his possessions, his provisions, his people, his piety, and his place. His possessions, his provisions, his people, his piety, and his place. And it was extraordinary. His wisdom. Now whose wisdom is it that Solomon's wisdom represents? It's the wisdom of Jesus. Romans 11 verse 33 speaking of Christ it says, Oh the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. It's unsearchable. It's deep. His house. Jesus said in John 14, you know this verse, verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. Do you think that the house of Solomon was better than the mansions that Jesus is preparing for us? Doesn't the Bible say that we can't even imagine that? She saw his food. What kind of food does Jesus, the son of David, have. Christ said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. So that's the food in the house. The sitting of his servants. Can you imagine what it must have looked like? You've probably seen some important meetings where you got the assembly of attendants from all over the place. Uh, they've got this new building they built in Brussels for the European Union and people from all over that union come and they sit and it, it's just very exquisite. It's a beautiful design. It's, you kind of overwhelm the sense of importance when you see these leaders from all these nations in the European Union come together in this beautifully designed building. Probably pretty dangerous prophetically what happens there but that's a different point. Can you imagine what it must have looked like? You've heard of King Arthur's Round Table? Can you imagine if Solomon invited you for dinner? You ever seen a nice spread for dinner? That's really something to behold. Can you imagine what it looks like when you sit down and Jesus serves us and we sup with him in his kingdom? Who's at that table? Sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sitting down with King David and the apostles. The Bible talks about that. Revelation 5 verse 11. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the numbers of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, his ministers all around the throne and the creatures and the leaders of other worlds. Uh, if you think it was glorious in Solomon's cabinet, can you imagine what it's like around Christ's table? And the Bible tells us that some of the kings of antiquity, they sat down and they had 27 other kings that sat around them. The, the royalty. Can you imagine what it must have been like at Solomon's table? And she sees all this and he's trying to really put on a show because he's got a queen. And it is breathtaking. Because of course Solomon was very rich as well. And their apparel. What kind of apparel do they wear in Jesus' kingdom? Around the throne. Revelation 4.4 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And these aren't just any kind of white robe. They're like the white robes you read around in Mark chapter 9 when Jesus was glorified and His garments became so white 
They couldn't find words to describe it. It's a different kind of white. It's like a living white. It's like a flaming sun. And so the garments of Solomon's servants were all clean. You didn't come with stains into the presence of King Solomon. Oh, by the way, we can't have stains when we come into the presence of King Jesus. That's what this life is for. He's to prepare a bride without spot or wrinkle or any stain, right? Their apparel. And then she saw his offerings to the Lord. Revelation 8 verse 4, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God in the angel's hand. Now you remember before Solomon even built the temple, he went up to Gibeon. You remember that study? And he offered a thousand animals. Can you imagine the billowing cloud of this incense going up before the Lord and, and the sacrifice? Matter of fact, I read this morning, but I haven't checked on it, that that word in Hebrew is similar to the word holocaust because there was an absolute holocaust of offerings. And I know you and I think that's kind of a grisly word, but Solomon, when he offered to the Lord, it was a generous, a lavish, an outpouring of offerings. And they offered animal sacrifice back then. And there was a whole army of priests bringing these offers to this enormous altar. And the smoke would just billow up. You know, Josephus says something that's interesting, just an amazing fact, a footnote that the record of history is that in spite of the fact there were all of these animals being brought and sacrificed to Jehovah in the temple of Solomon, they never saw a fly there. No insect ever entered the courtyard. Now that's believable because it says when Solomon dedicated his temple, fire came down from heaven, the glory of God was there. And that's a great repellent, I suppose, <laughs> for insects. <laughs> you could just sell that in a bottle of lotion, right? <laughs> but there were no insects, they said, uh, during that. So she saw all of this and it left her absolutely breathless. How did she respond? This is beautiful. In 2 Chronicles 9 verse 6, she, a matter of fact, I'm going to read this to you actually, not just from my notes, but I want to read it to you uh, from the scripture, turning your Bibles there. Go to verse 5. Then she said to the king, It was a true report. Now, by the way, I think this is the first time she speaks. It was a true report that I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. What is it about Solomon that she heard that attracted her? His word. What is it about Jesus that changes lives and changes worlds and countries? It's his word and his wisdom. However, I did not believe their words until I came and saw with my own eyes. Is it important for us to see with our own eyes? Well, you know, Jesus said, Blessed are those who believe without seeing. He said to Thomas, You believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who believe his word without seeing. But you know, when you live there on the thoroughfare of all these caravans, you hear all kinds of stories. She wanted to know it was the truth. She wanted a first-hand experience, and you can't really fault her for that. You know, you need to see for yourself some things. Christ said, if I am lifted up, I'll draw. You need to see. What brought about the conversion of Paul? Saul saw the Lord. The thief on the cross was converted when he saw the Lord. What is it that Zacchaeus wanted when he climbed a tree? He wanted to see Jesus. When he saw him for himself, was his heart transformed? When Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness and the people were bitten by the venomous reptiles, what did they need to do to live? They needed to look. Could you look for someone else? If you had someone sick in the tent and said, well, I'll look for you, would that save you? Or did you need to look for yourself? We all need to see sometimes some things for ourselves. Now, we can see in His Word, so I'm not saying that, you know, you've got to see Jesus physically, but she wanted a personal experience. And we need to really commend her for that. I didn't believe till I came and I saw. You come to Jesus, the son of David, and you see. Come to him the way you are. Indeed, the half of your greatness and wisdom was not told me. You exceed the fame of what I heard. When the enemies of Jesus sent spies to try to trap him, they came back without Christ being arrested. And they said, why have you not brought him? You know what the response was? Wow. Never a man spake as this man. 
They were breathless. The words of Christ. She said, the half was not told me. You know, uh, I remember the story of Marco Polo after his adventures in China and all that he saw, an incredible journey. And the time he lived there and learning the language and going around the nation of China and the wonders of China. And he came back and he told the people in Venice. And Venice was in the dark ages during this time. It was like 1200 something. He tells them about this wall over a thousand miles long. And they say, oh, come on now, that's another sailor's story. He says, they use paper money. Oh, that would be the craziest thing in the world. That's what they said to him. And he was telling them about their food and, and silk and, and how they harvest the worms. And silk comes from worms. They didn't believe it. They knew they bought silk. They didn't know where it came from. And so as Marco Polo was telling them all these stories, they said, you're a liar. Matter of fact, on his deathbed, the priests came by and they begged Marco Polo to recant of his lies and tales that he had told. And you know what he responded? He said, recant? He says, I haven't told you the half of what I saw. <laughs> and you know, so often when you hear stories, things are exaggerated, but every now and then it's even bigger and better than what you've been told. Anything I might tell you about Jesus, the son of David, our type of Solomon in his kingdom, I can't come anywhere near explaining it to you. She said, indeed, the half of the greatness of your wisdom was not told me. You exceed the fame of which I heard. Happy, notice this. She says, happy, happy, blessed. Happy are your men, and happy are these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord, your God, who delighted in you in setting you on his throne to be king for the Lord your God. She noticed that Solomon was not the ultimate king. Solomon taught her that he was a servant of the real king. Because your God has loved Israel to establish them forever. Spiritual Israel does last forever, and you can be part of that. Therefore he made you king over them. Jesus is king over that people forever to do justice and righteousness. That's an in incredible declaration of what she says about the goodness of God. Now, I want to go back here and I want you to notice something. Turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 4 verse 5. I see I've got a couple moments left. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 5. That's of course the last in the books of Moses. What was the plan for God's people? Moses is speaking. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should act according to them in the land that you go to possess. Listen, verse 6. Therefore be careful to observe them. Observe my word, statutes and laws. For this is your wisdom. Notice the word wisdom. And your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear. He's saying about all these nations around you. These statutes and say, surely this nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it? The temple was right there in Jerusalem with the presence of God. As the Lord our God is to us. And what, whatever reason we might call upon Him, He's right here to ask Him. Can you imagine any question you got? Solomon's right there in your kingdom. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as in all this law that I set before you this day? You hear what Moses is saying. This is the last message of Moses. He said, my goal for you is you've got the best truth of any nation. You've got the truth around the world. You are a nation of priests. You are to be a light to the world. When people see your righteous judgments and your statutes, they're going to say there is no people that has the truth like these people. By the way, you know virtually every nation in the world, its civil law is based on the law of Moses. I mean, what nation is there that doesn't at least go by the last six commandments? Don't steal, don't lie, respect for marriage. Of course, we're starting to lose some of that here, aren't we? Respect for your parental authority, not uh, coveting, everybody suing everybody. I mean, you know, you can see what happens when that stuff implodes. But virtually every nation in the world used the law of the Jews 
as the foundation for social and civil and moral law. What nation of the world is there that has such righteous laws? This is what the Queen of Sheba did. Uh, you know, let me tell you what I'm trying to say before I'm done with the sermon. The essence, the core. This story is the peak example of what God's will was for His people. He wanted to bless them. He said, if you obey me, as they did during this time of Solomon. Now part two of Solomon, or rather the next uh, message on Solomon, things take a turn. But at this point they'd reached the actual peak and the evidence of that zenith was the other nations were coming to find out about their God. That was God's plan. He didn't want to keep it just among the Israelites. He wanted it to disseminate around the world. And so she said, you're blessed, happy, happy, blessed. That's what God wants for you when we obey His laws and do His will. So as she departs, she probably gave him some spices and gifts along the way. Verse 10 of 1 Kings 10, she gave the king a hundred and twenty talents of gold. That by our standards is nine million two hundred and sixteen thousand dollars of gold. A very great store of spices and precious stones. No spice came any more for abundance that the Queen of Sheba gave to Solomon. Whenever Israel looked at their history, they never saw more and better gold and spices and gems coming into the treasury and into the nation as when the Queen of Sheba came, everybody got a little of that spice back then because there was so much of it that she brought in her caravans. She gives a gift. You notice she's so thankful for all that uh, God has done for her. She basically unloads everything and says, you know, I just want to bless you. I want to give you a gift. Thank you so much for answering my questions. I know your God is the true God. And she took the knowledge of Jehovah back to her country to spread it everywhere. And that was God's plan. Something else you notice? She brought the best she had. What do you, any of you have to buy a gift for someone difficult? Can you imagine trying to buy a gift for Solomon? What do you get him? Electric razor? They don't have electricity. <laughs> what do you get King Solomon when he's got uh, billions of dollars of money? What do you think made Solomon the happiest? The money and the gold and the spices that she gave or the questions that she asked? What did Solomon treasure the most? His riches or wisdom? What did Solomon ask for when God said, what do you want? Wisdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's what she did his righteousness, his wisdom. I think Solomon was satisfied that she had come looking for wisdom, looking for knowledge, looking for truth. He gave her as much time as she wanted. Another point I don't want to rush past. When she went to visit King Solomon, she did not go alone in her pursuit of truth. It says she brought a very great company, a very great retinue, others with her. And on your journey, on your pilgrimage through this life, looking for truth, is this a journey we take one day, hop on a plane, find out truth and come home? Or are we on a caravan right now crossing the desert in this wilderness? We're looking for truth every day. There is absolute truth, but it's progressive in the way we learn it. And the more you walk in the light, the more God gives you. You walk in the truth He's given you, He'll give you more. Amen? Bring others with you in your search for truth. Then finally, what I think is beautiful, the story's not quite over yet. Second Chronicles 9 verse 12, and you'll have to go to Chronicles for this one. Second Chronicles 9 verse 12. Now King Solomon gave to the queen, wait a second, I thought she was given to the king. Now he's given to her. Now King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all she desired, whatever she asked, much more than she had brought to the king. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. Wait a second. Whenever I hear about the story of the Queen of Sheba, I think that she's the one who's asking for her knowledge. She comes and she pays for her knowledge. But before she heads back home, she says, boy, you've got some things in this country we just don't have out there in the desert. We don't have cedar. Can we take some cedar trees back with us? He said, all that you want. He was a very generous king. 
And she said, you know, there's some spices we brought, but you got things here we don't have. And I don't know what she asked for. I'll bet you that she said, can we have a copy of your law? I mean, after this whole trip, do you think that she left without a copy of the Torah? I think she said, I, I would like your sacred writings. Can we take them back with us? And along with provisions for the trip, they had a long way to go back home. But it says she left with more than she brought. Did I make that up or is that what it says? I'm showing you my notes. It's in the Bible too. Does it mean she left with more money? It doesn't say money. But she left with more. What does a woman represent in Bible analogy prophecy? How many times have you heard me ask that question? A woman is a type of the church. When we come to the house of God, we're seeking wisdom, aren't we? And we bring our gifts. But do we leave with more than we bring? That's the way it ought to work. When you come to worship God, and He gives you of His Spirit, He gives you of His wisdom, you open the Bible and read, you're going to leave with more than you brought. You can't outgive God. You know, this is a principle that you should never forget, whatever the category, whether it's talking about spiritual truth or your time or your means, whenever you give anything to others or God, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. She came and she unloaded her caravan in Solomon's kingdom. She stored her treasure in the new Jerusalem, in the old Jerusalem, right? When she left, she left, she says, blessed, blessed, happy. She was enriched, she was satisfied. She left with more than she brought. You and I are to store our treasures in the new Jerusalem. We bring them before our King Solomon, and we'll end up receiving more than we give. She went home. She came kind of bewildered, pondering all these questions, perplexed, a little anxious. She left breathless, overflowing. She had enough memories to last her lifetime. She took the knowledge of the true God back down to the straits there of um, the Arabian Sea and the Red Sea. And everybody that came by, she was talking about the true God, Jehovah. She wasn't confused about what the truth was anymore. She became an ambassador for the God of heaven because of the witness of Solomon. Now that's God's plan for His church. When people come into our church, do they say what the Queen of Sheba says? When they behold our apparel, the righteous robes of Christ, when our food, the bread of life, when they come to our church and they behold the sitting, the order of His servants and the way things are done, they say, surely God is in this place. Wouldn't you like to uh, have visitor come to our church and say what the Queen of Sheba said? Have a breathtaking experience when they come to the house of God. Amen? Amen? And she saw their offering before the Lord, the sacrifice of themselves and their praise. That, I believe, is God's plan for His church. Final question. She prepared a long time for that journey to go to Jerusalem to meet the son of David. Probably spent months preparing for that journey. She packed, she loaded, she thought about what it would mean to make that journey. Are you preparing for a journey to the New Jerusalem now. I'm hoping that you'll be able to put yourself in the place of this noble queen and say, like that woman, I want to be part of God's people that prepare for this trip to the New Jerusalem and that are willing to invest everything to know what is and to live by what is truth. Jesus, the Son of David, is the truth that will set us free. Can you say amen, friends? I thought it'd be good for us to close our service by singing an anthem. You'll find it in your uh, songbooks as number six, and we're going to sing the praises to God. Now, I will excuse myself from the platform because I'm going to prepare for a baptism. And if you're able to stay by, we'll be having a special baptism for a young lady in just a moment. Oh, worship the Lord. Let's stand together as we sing.
seated. Just before we uh, have the baptism, let's just bow our heads and uh, we'll pray and thank the good Lord for the sermon we heard this morning. Gracious Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the story of Solomon. We appreciate the way Pastor Doug is taking us through this history of this uh, man's life. And uh, we pray that the things that we have heard this morning and the lessons that we have learned, the spiritual lessons that we can apply to our own lives. And as the Queen of Sheba was willing to go many, many miles to hear the wisdom that you had uh, given Solomon, may we be willing to go, as it were, to the ends of this earth, that we might find that same wisdom, the wisdom of salvation through Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Lord, that you give us your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and light unto our path. And we praise you for this. We give you all the praise, all the thanks, for you are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this broadcast. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents, Central Study Hour, Everlasting Gospel, Bible Answers Live, and Wonders in the Word. You'll also find a storehouse of biblical resources geared towards answering some of your most difficult questions. And our online Bible school is just a click away. One location, so many possibilities. AmazingFacts.org.